My name is Mariangela Zappia. I was born in Viadana, uh, near Mantova in Italy, and I am the Italian ambassador to the US. I was born in Rome from an Italian father, Roberto Rossellini, that was a, a renowned filmmaker. And uh, my mother instead was a Swedish actress called Ingrid Bergman. My name is Natalia Bergamaschi. Uh, I was born in Ancona. I grew up in Puglia, moved to Milan. I lived in Milan 22 years and then moved to New York 11 years ago. My name is Cecilia Alemani. I am an Italian curator. I was born in Milan back in 1977 and I've been living in New York City since 2003. My name is Cristina Cassetti. I was born in Rome and I'm now a scientist uh, in Washington, D.C. at the National Institute of Health. My mother. Well, this is really the typical example where the strong part, the pillar of the family is in a way hidden. And this was my mother. My mother was taking care of us and of the house. She was at home, but she was really the engine around all this, uh, a woman that you know, sacrificed herself a lot uh, for us. My father was an amazing figure, a very nice man, and he has this very strong uh, sense of serving his country. This is really what um, impacted on me uh, very strongly. And so at one point I, I looked for something that was similar to that. How could I serve my country? When I was born, they lived in Italy, uh, for my first three years and then uh, my parents divorced and so we started to live between Paris and Rome. My mom established herself in Paris, my father's film, a lot of them were co-production with France, so France and Paris was a, a place where my parents worked and it became our second home. And then when I became 18 I moved to New York to do the college and uh, stayed ever since. My father was the first feminist I met in my life. He wanted for us the best and always thought about education as the most important thing for us. He used to say, education is the only thing nobody can steal from you. The rules in my home were very simple. You never give up. Tough things and situations make you stronger. Uh, nothing is impossible. If you do something, you do it at your best. My grandfather was an art history teacher, and I think my mother and my father always took me to museums and to, to see great, important cities. When I was back in Milan, I was studying philosophy at the University of Milan, and uh, I sort of understood that I could sort of apply what I was studying, which was extremely abstract, to a, a very pragmatic field, which was the curating in contemporary art. My mother, she uh, was, and she still is, the backbone of our family. She was the probably the prototypical warm and strong Sicilian mother. She was completely dedicated to her family, to her children and she made sure that we had a very stable, warm and loving environment to grow up in. I'm the youngest one of four children. I had three older brothers. We were all treated the same. <laughs> and uh, it was a very wonderful place to, to grow up. I always was interested in biology and science. My passion was stimulated by my parents. They saw their interest in me and they fostered it with uh, books and buying me microscopes and chemistry sets and all of that. My father was uh, a scientist in um, uh, aeronautical engineering in Rome and he worked for the uh, Italian Air Force. So my father treated the, my brothers and myself just the same. He always valued education and studying. He really led by example. He didn't really put pressure on us or stress us out about performing in the studies. And um, it was just by osmosis, I guess, that many of us became interested in, uh, in, in science. Choosing a woman for a post like being permanent representative to NATO, for instance, which is a totally male environment, was a statement. Things are changing and everything is possible even for women. You know, you have to adapt 
in this role of being the first. And this is, I think, what we, we need to keep in mind all the time uh, when we're, we are young and, and we are, you know, having a project, having a perspective, having a, a dream. Just don't think that that dream cannot be possible because you are a woman. English, uh, especially when I grew up in the 60s, was the language that you had to know if you wanted to have an international ability to communicate with people. And I attended the college and I loved it. And then I got a job. I was working as an assistant to a journalist called Gianni Mina that was a sports journalist. Gianni was always late. And so sometimes I would do the interviews for him and then we would uh, edit the interview so that I wasn't in. But somebody noticed that I had uh, the ability to ask questions, and that was Renzo Arbore, who is a very known uh, Italian showman. And he was looking for correspondents from all over the world, and so he offered me to be the correspondent from New York. I would send uh, Renzo Arbore for a program that was called L'Altra Domenica, you know, four or five minutes edit about life in New York, whether it was the opening of a film or a concert or pigeons or Times Square. There was an interview with Martin Scorsese, the filmmaker, who have met and married, not right after the interview, <laughs> but, you know, we kind of see each other and fell in love. And then I was married to an American. So that kept me in New York. I decided to apply for a master in contemporary art and curatorial studies here in New York. And that's why I sort of moved my entire life here at the, in the early 2000s. After that, I worked for a few years as an independent curator. And then around 2009, I started uh, one of the most uh, meaningful positions that I had in my career which was overseeing an exhibition space, which was called X Initiative. And it was very much uh, uh, in the midst of the recession of 2008, but I could feel the energy of the art community coming together. And that's something that I always carry with me as a curator. I met through a friend, a person who just started a startup. And I said to him, you are at the beginning, you don't have the money to pay a full-time salesperson, but I'm going to sell your digital advertising and you will pay me just when I sell something, a percentage. I succeeded in a way to make that work and, and, to, be, and to enjoy it until one day when Google called. And the more interviews I, I did, the more I wanted to work for Google. Final interview, I was there ready to prove myself and my best and enter this guy younger than me, no kids, no married. And he asked me, I see you have two young kids. If we will have a meeting at 8 p.m. in the night, how are you going to do with them? And so I told him, well, I tell you what I think. I think that if you have a meeting at 8 p.m., you are mistaking something because I am a mom and I've been working. I know you can organize yourself and work very hard for seven, eight hours in a day, and there is no need to have a meeting at 8 p.m. But I'm telling you this, if there is like once in a year an emergency, a fire drill, and you will need me at midnight, I will be here. But if you are telling me the common practice of this company is to organize meeting at 8 p.m., I'm not the right candidate after they made me the offer, after I was hired. I spoke with him and I asked him, Fabrizio, but why you ask me that question? It's not you, it's not who you are. And he said, that, that was a trick. I wanted to know because I saw your, your story. I saw you were a mama for four years. I wanted to know how bad you wanted this job, but how authentic you were. So actually I have to say, Fabrizio told me that he had decided to hire me because of that answer. I completely decided back then that I wanted to study viruses, especially emerging viruses. That was uh, what I wanted to do. So I finished my studies in Rome, and then my professor then encouraged me to do a fellowship to go abroad. And I decided to come to the National Institute of Health to work for this um, top virologist. This was probably one of the most well-regarded virologists, and uh, my professor gave me a, a strong letter of recommendation, and uh, he accepted me to his lab. I thought I was in a playground. 
<laughs> I had done research in Rome, but you know, in a small lab with not uh, many resources. And here I am in this lab with basically unlimited resources and surrounded by some of the smartest people I ever met in my life. I was the first again um, as diplomatic advisor to the prime minister. Basically, is the main advisor of, of our prime minister in uh, on foreign policy. It was an amazing experience. Um, you are in the room, uh, in the room where decisions are taken, uh, where important discussions are taken. You are there when your country has a an important responsibility, like in the case of the presidency of the G7 or the presidencies of the G20, uh, you are there because you see the interaction um, among leaders. You understand um, a lot of this um, power struggle. You understand a lot about partnership, about alliances. It was really an amazing experience and a great privilege. Of course, I, at the beginning, my mom was a very known actress and I was intimidated to be an actress. But I remember working with Richard Avedon, the photographer for the cover of Vogue magazine. And Avedon said to me, you know, ultimately modeling is not that far away from acting. I really photograph the emotions and that's the same as an actress. So you don't have a story to tell or an arc of emotion because a still photo will just capture one emotion at the time but it is related. I always said, no, no, no. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe I should try, why not? And, and then I tried and liked it very much. And uh, my third film was Blue Velvet, which was very controversial when it came out, but also really established me as an actress. That was with director David Lynch, who was considered uh, controversial, difficult, uh, but nowadays David is revered as one of, of the great filmmakers. Four years at Google Italy, I was having a blast. I was selling advertising to fashion and luxury brands. So you can imagine how glamorous was my job meeting with these clients. During this process, while I was enjoying, the kids were growing, we moved to the center de Milan. I was accomplished in my job. I had a wonderful husband. I still remember one day I was in the office, he called me and said, and by the way, Natalia, guess what? Today they offered me a job in New York. And I asked him, what did you respond? And he said, I said, no, of course. I cannot jeopardize your job, our life. He said, no. And I remember I told him, can you go back and say yes? And he said, yes, I can. Okay, let's speak about this tonight. And we spoke and we decided, oh, this is a perfect opportunity. We go to New York for one year. The kids will learn English, what a better opportunity. And I will find a job in New York, no problem. I didn't know that was going to be much more, not just for the kids, for us, for me and for my husband. I am the uh, director and chief curator of the art program, which is called Highline Art. For those of you who don't know the Highline, uh, it is a public park of the city of New York. It is built on an elevated uh, bridge that used to carry trains or freight trains. And so in the late 1990s, an organization called Friends of the Highline decided to get together and try to rescue and save this piece of industrial uh, archaeology that was just sitting in Chelsea without any use. The Highland became a public park. Now you can walk 10 meters above the street for about two and a half kilometers and you can enjoy not only a great example of architecture and design but also a piece of history and contemporary art which I oversee. So inviting artists to do uh, public projects, commissions, installations, sculptures, murals, and again, using the most beautiful part of the Highland, which is its people and the views of the surrounding cities. So my children, I mean, I had really 10 good years of raising my children. It was, you know, everything was manageable until Zika happened. Zika was a mosquito-borne disease. And my division director back then puts me in charge of building a program and she gives me carte blanche. She said, okay, you make your team, pick all the people that you want from, from our division. You tell us what we should do first. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I was like, can I, I like, I was like, oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Let's do this. But after the Zika epidemic, our director, Dr. Fauci said, we need to see what we learned from the response to this 
epidemic called Zika, and be prepared for the next one to come because we know another viral infection is going to come at some point. We don't know when, but we know it's going to happen. And then in 2019, they recruited me to be the deputy director of the whole division. This is a division of 200 people and over $2 billion in a yearly budget. You know, at one point, it was becoming difficult. We were moving all the time, um, every two years. My kids, I have two kids, Claire and Christian. I felt they were suffering of this. And so after thinking a lot, I took the decision to, to take a leave. It was probably one of the most difficult decisions of my life. Because, you know, when you are in a career, you basically decide to stop, to freeze your career. But, you know, for me, the priority at that moment were my kids. From time to time, of course, I was concerned. Uh, how can I get back? Uh, how much I will be penalized by what I did? Uh, but in the end, um, it went well. I went back to, to work uh, four years after, and here I am. So this is another message, I think, that I, I feel I, I need to give it's also possible to make choices like the one I did. Uh, if, you, if you need to uh, give time to your family, uh, it's so important uh, for yourself and for them, for their future, you know, it's possible. You can do it and you can always go back to, to work later. It takes strength, um, it takes uh, determination, uh, but it's possible. When I moved to the States that summer, my father was diagnosed with stage four of cancer, colon cancer. And so I was trying to handle that emotional moment, but also trying to find the energy to embrace this new life. I started to apply to job here in US. In Italy, I was kind of senior, but because it's a bigger market, uh, bigger competition was really difficult for me even to get to the interview. Then I asked to my Italian manager, can you give me the opportunity to work for Italy from New York? And I was very lucky. It was a kind of a gentleman agreement for us having two months to find a job. So the clock started to tick for me. I could spend eight hours in the office without speaking in person to anybody just speaking with Italy, with, with my Italian clients, with my Italian colleagues, but nobody around me. 10 months into my new job, COVID hits. And so at first we didn't know, is this the big one? That we decided to put many shots on goal. So, okay, let's do some mRNA vaccine, let's do a viral vector vaccine, let's do a protein vaccine. Hopefully some of those would work um, and we will have them. So this is, early on in 2020. And then, of course, there is a, the, the outbreak comes to Italy, which was horrendous, I mean, for us sitting there. And we knew it was going to come here. I mean, it was just like a tsunami, right? You know, even if uh, last two years, there have been lots of distractions, political things and fighting and all that. And it always brought us back to remind us, why do we do what we do? You know, helping people through research. We're just doing that. Everything else is just a distraction. Try to tone it down and do your job. This is a great honor. To, to be the ambassador of Italy in the United States is, um, is really a big thing. I never thought about that. And, and, and then as things happen in this career, it just came. I think it's really a message um, that Italy wants to put women at the core of um, its action. And if you look at, for instance, a, at the recovery plan after the pandemic and what the government is doing, women are really at the core of the recovery, of the economic recovery. A lot of the weight was in the end on, uh, on women. Um, they lost their job because they had to be at home with the kids and it's much more difficult for women to, to go back to work. So I, I think by appointing me here, there was this uh, message also very, very strongly. The first day I entered my office, my, my staff, uh, who was at the time uh, half uh, military, asked me, how do you want to be called? Uh, male ambassador, female ambassador, ambasciatore, ambasciatrice. And I said, ambasciatrice. And, and, uh, but this gives you the idea of uh, the environment around you has also to, to adapt to not only you know, how to call you, but how um, a woman exerts her own leadership. 
and, and it's different. So follow your dreams. This is really um, what I suggest to do, what I advise uh, young women to do. Follow your dreams and, and really everything is possible. Between 40 and, you know, 55, uh, the film and the writers don't know how to use an, an actress. Uh, now, my, maybe things are changing now that there is the, so much of the downloading because it can reach uh, a new audience. You know, before the audience was always uh, mostly young people. And so there were action movie, adventure movie, witches, may, maybe <laughs> a grandmother occasionally. So then the work came back at 60. Mama said, after 60, the work came back. But I didn't know that. So between 40 and 60, I was working less and so I went back to university and took a master's degree on animal behavior and conservation, which is something I wanted to do since I was a child. And so while I was uh, studying, I started writing this uh, fun short films. That, uh, my producer was Robert Redford, of all people, a wonderful filmmaker and actor, very involved in experimental films. Uh, he's particularly known for the Sundance Film Festival, so Sundance offered me the possibility, and I did a series of short films that became quite successful. I called an internal recruiter and I said, listen, forget about senior roles, what I was doing, give me something that I can start from scratch to learn. And because of this new approach in two weeks, I found a job in a different department. And the beginning of this new job in Google, so super excited, super happy, finally with a job at Google US. 10 years later, where I am now, that job that was really a tough job for me, brought me to what I'm doing today, that in my opinion is the best job you could dream about. I work in the partnership team right now covering um, cross-Google collaborations with news publishers. We really have the possibility to impact journalism. And I know, and you know, journalism is the only possible option in a democracy. Without journalism, democracy couldn't even exist. What made me really excited about science, sometimes you do an experiment, and you get the result. And you're the very first person in the world that understands how a virus does a certain thing. And that is such, I can't explain how, exci <laughs> how exciting that is. You get a preview in something that nature and this creation has given us. There is such a buzz to it that uh, it's hard to describe. You always have to doubt. Um, that's part of being a scientist. You can't be um, married to your idea. You just have to be flexible with how you look at problems. And um, there shouldn't be a lot of space for ego in science. I am the first Italian woman to curate the Venice Biennale. And for those that are not familiar with that, the Venice Biennale has been around for 127 years. I was extremely uh, happy and honored, but very soon I also realized the great job that I had in front of me, the responsibility, the burden too. <laughs> so I got right into it. Just two months after I was nominated, you know, the COVID outbreak arrived in New York City. It was the second week of March. A few weeks afterwards, the Biennale decided to postpone the show of one year. So I met, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of artists through uh, Zoom in the little office uh, that is more like a closet than an office, uh, but there was this weird kind of, um, a relationship that got formed because in a way we all spent hours and hours talking to strangers with this uh, weird window onto people's life and it's so intimate in a way because you're looking at people's apartment and sometimes you get to call people from the weirdest corners of your apartment <laughs> and I think I had very meaningful conversations with hundreds of artists and in a way they were maybe less focused on the artworks themselves but it was more focused on uh, the sort of preoccupations and anxieties and very much an existential conversation with them. And so that's what I kind of try to distill in this exhibition. 161 years of relations um, between Italy and the United States and um, so many male ambassadors. What we have in the embassies 
all over the world is what we call the Galleria, the gallery. And the Galleria is the, you know, the portraits of, of the ambassadors um, that have been ambassador in the country. Indeed, also here in this embassy, there is a wall and the wall is a long series of male portraits. Well, at one point, uh, there will be mine too. So you feel the pressure. You feel that, uh, you know, everyone is looking at you, observing you. You are indeed the first and, and you also have a responsibility to show that you can do it, that uh, any woman can, can do it. And that most of all, young women uh, can, are looking at you as an example and, uh, and they are maybe realizing at the same time that they can also do it and they can also have a, you know, a nice career. Working in a tech corporation in U.S. as a woman, I think is as difficult as in any other sector. Gender inequality really touch every industry. I am optimistic because I am close enough to the concept of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and everything tech companies can do to know that they will be an incredible booster to reach gender equality. And there will be many that build all together a better society. I was using my Google Doc to write down a memo. I realized that now in Google Doc, you have also inclusion alerts. So I got an alert on the word of paternity that says inclusion warning, thinking, you should in maybe include also maternity. This inclusion warning can be the beginning of a process where our awareness about gender inequality increase. I was looking at even my institute. I mean, things are changing, but they still not equality. I mean, in the top uh, layers of leadership, 12 leaders, two are women and 10 are men. But it's changing. It used to be no women, now it's two women, and in the next generation is going to get better and better, I think. But I thank, I guess, the first generation of women before me to really making the path easier for me. And I want to make the path easier for the women that will follow me, younger scientists, women, that they want to pursue this career. So the obstacles are the predictable obstacles, the, you know, coordinating your personal life with your professional life, uh, the fact that we travel a lot, that we live in different countries. And so if you have a family, it's more difficult than a, a normal job where you live in a city and, and your kids go to school from, from first grade to the end. And the other challenge is also to convince the environment around you that you're bringing something that is a bit different. Um, and what you're bringing in the end is really the woman perspective. And this is to me really at the core of what I think should be um, conceived as gender equality and gender parity and, and the equality of opportunities is simply bringing at the table the woman perspective. It is always challenging to be a woman in, uh, in the contemporary world, regardless that it's art or finance or business. And I think in that sense, I've been very lucky to work for a very progressive institution like the Highline that has never in any way put me aside because I was a woman. I actually uh, foster my creativity and embrace that. So I think in a way, I'm an optimistic person. I like to look forward and not backwards. So I think the world is changing also in Italy, which is great, uh, but it is also due to the many fights that many women have done in the past, in the past century or so. When you start modeling, you, you, you don't expect that it is a career that lasts a long time. But my modeling lasted for 20 years at least. But when I reached my 40s, and I had this long, very successful contract with a cosmetic company called Lancôme, and so Lancôme too decided to, uh, in spite of the great success that we had together in our collaboration, not to renew my contract. I remember talking to the executive at Lancôme because when he did a marketing research, the women said that they liked me very much. And so I would say, well, why, why do you let me go if they like me very much? My executive rationalized it by saying that women dream to be young and advertisement is about dreams. So a 40 year old woman cannot represent the dream of being young. 
and that's why they were letting me go. In the 20 years that I didn't work with Lancôme, things evolved in society, and now a lot of women executives are in, in the cosmetic companies that were dominated by men who might have only understood the pleasure of using lipstick as a seductive tool. There is something in the female that likes to decorate the house, decorate ourselves. Uh, it's the same gesture for me. And so when women executive came in, the campaign became more complete. And the CEO of Lancôme, Françoise Liman, called me and said, we want you to come back. So that was very moving to me. And so uh, in the last seven years, I, I have been working with Lancôme again. So when I was in New York, um, I came to, to know the International Gender Champion uh, Program. So is, is really um, considering yourself a model, considering yourself a, a mentor, giving the example. And this is about really showing that it's possible, that, that what we do, what I do is possible. You know, that there is a way in which women can not only contribute, that's, that's normal, but also bring an added value to the conversation, to the policy perspective, to whatever you are involved in. You need determination. Uh, you need really to, to have this in mind all the time no matter which policy you are uh, implementing or, or, or adopting. I was struck from this number I read in one of the last Harvard Business Review about pandemic and the impact on women. Despite the fact that women represent 39% of global employment, they were the ones more impacted by the job loss due to the pandemic. 54% of the total job loss. We kind of got back a few steps in the last couple of years. There is this interesting number that McKinsey Lean In report is really giving us some hope. And is saying that if we take action now on gender equality, by 2030, we will be able to gain 13 trillions of dollars in global GDP. Yes, women were particularly hit by, by the pandemic, but the pandemic in a way also served as a, as a way to amplify um, this, this disparity that still exists. And, and uh, my hope is that really government realize that it's a smart thing to do, to, to have equal opportunity society is really the smart thing to do because it's the smart thing to do from an economic point of view. You, if you allow women to be part, for instance, of the job market in the same way as men, you are certainly strengthening your economy. It's the smart thing to do, but it takes determination. So you have to, to have objectives, uh, targets, and then uh, you have to work to reach those, those targets. I have a very strong network of female friends. I mean, I, I live away from my family. My, my original family is in Italy. I'm the only one here in the US. We had a very strong network of female friends and we were helping each other. Sometimes it was a snow day and the kids couldn't go to school, but you had to go to the office. So we were just taking turns about helping each other. And I found that women, they're incredible advocates for other women and they're very supportive. I think the biggest risk uh, for my exhibition is to be labeled as the Biennale of women, of women artists, because of the great majority of women. To me, it's always interesting that nobody has ever done the reverse comment in 125 years when most of the artists have been men. So I hope that eventually people will be able to uh, go to see this exhibition without thinking about the gender of the artist. So the advice I would give to young scientists, maybe even Italian scientists coming abroad for an experience, don't be intimidated by the fact that you're different. A difference is good. <laughs> it's actually, in, now that I lead big teams, uh, I find that diversity is a huge strength. In viruses, when you have an infection, all the viruses that replicate in your body, they're not all exactly the same. They make a, a swarm of viruses, it's called quasi-species. And the, the reason why they're all a little bit different is because if the conditions change, 
there's always going to be some viruses that are more fit to respond to the new condition. So diversity allows the virus to respond no matter what and survive. So in teams, when you have a big challenge, like a new pandemic or like a huge outbreak, you want a very diverse team because there's always going to be someone that has different ideas, so different ways of approaching a problem, which is always a strength when things change quickly and you need to find new solutions. So I guess the advice to young people is don't be scared of your diversity. Diversity is a good thing. I think my most important advice is always to be curious and to spend as much time as you possibly can seeing art, seeing exhibitions, meeting artists, reading and studying. It's not necessarily an easy job to get into right away because uh, also there is an explosion of uh, curators right now in the world and unfortunately there is not an explosion of jobs. Uh, but don't give up and always be curious to expand your knowledge and your relationship with the artists because in the end that's how things then uh, come out. So. My kids are very clear. They, they don't want to be diplomats in their, in their life. Uh, so they're doing uh, really very different things and I'm very proud of them. But I think they, they look at me as, um, as an example. They are very proud. There is something that is um, about uh, how important it is for women to be in, in, in those places. So it's not only proud for, for, for the mother, but it's also that they are proud of seeing a woman in those places and, and um, they realize how important it is. I think my son has been educated in a very progressive way. He welcomes differences and things that for us were really hard to understand maybe and to, to accept without even thinking that that could be an issue. And so sometimes it, it seemed that teaches me how to be a more contemporary mother than the other way around. To have a great family, it's the joy of my life. So I don't see it as a sort of duality or a polarity. It's, uh, it's part of who I am. And I think he made me even a better curator or a better person than what I used to be. I was born with a love for animals. I always had uh, dogs, cats, we always had them growing up. But I did have like a lot of New Yorker, a house in the country where we came on the weekend because New York is very chaotic, very urban. So a lot of New Yorkers need a break from the city and we all, the one of us who can, have a second home in the countryside. And about 15 years ago, I moved permanently to my countryside and started a farm, which is now called Mama Farm where we have chickens and sheep, ducks and bees. We are still in the process of discovering, but this small artisanal farm have an incredible impact in the community. I remember every day coming back from school, my father taking the guitar and asking me to play piano. It still is so important for me because it's like my anti-stress activity. I play the songs I used to play with my father every day after lunch. We were lucky because we enjoyed a few more years with my dad, uh, four Christmases before he passed away. It's called Mama Farm because there is a lot of mothers and children coming to see this is a carrot, this is a potato, these are the seasons, these are the animals, these are the baby's animals. And now we're just starting a program with wool. And I contacted my Accademia di Costume e Moda where I went to Italy and contacted also the New York School of Fashion to collaborate with uh, uh, students and learn about different breeds of sheep and a different quality of the wool. So I see, I see the small farms to be a place where biodiversity can be maintained. So at my farm, I have a lot of these uh, old breeds that are highly endangered. I have traveled all over the world, but I, I have never seen something similar to Italy in terms of, you know, the density of beauty which is history, culture, nature, um, people, is this mix that is so unique. So it's, it, it's about beauty and harmony. Italy for me is that. In Italy, you know that the change that you can make is so little because your life is so irrelevant. What we can do is to take care of the things you have loved, whether it's the Colosseum, 
or good food or farming or a culture. It's more evident in Italy than in America, where everything is very much projected toward the future and making money. The thing that I miss the most from Italy are, of course, the food, in particular focaccia. I'm a big fan. I think in New York, I still have not found great, a great bakery. I think pizza is great in New York, but focaccia, mm -mm. And then, of course, I miss my family and I love being in Milan and it's a city that I love. What I miss most of Italy, uh, obviously, is my family. We have a very tight-knit family. I have three older brothers. I have friends, very close friends. But then, of course, it's the culture, the atmosphere, the way that people relate to each other, the warmth. When I go to Italy, I just feel at home. As a dream right now, I think I'm concentrating uh, more on my farm and how to make it financially viable. I think there is a whole movement about uh, the environment and conservation, which is stewardship of our planet, and also the culture that it brings, the knowledge that it brings, children knowing what the animals are, the different kind of wolves, the different kind of eggs, the different kinds of seasons, what vegetable it, bring, it brings. That's an enormous culture. My dream now is a, probably a very concrete uh, dream, but it's really all related to climate change. If I see some progress in this lifetime, I believe we can still hope to survive and to make this world surviving and making, making it safer for next generations. My next dream. <laughs> My next dream is to go to a monastery for a re silence retreat in which there is no Zoom, no phone calls, and no emails. I want to keep learning. <laughs> I want to keep pushing myself to do different things and learn more and try to have an impact in even small ways with all the people around me and my job and my children. I have this dream of doing a coast to coast by bicycle in the US. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it because it takes uh, quite a bit of time, but uh, maybe one day I'll do it. My next dream, um, to see my kids um, happy and fulfilled in, in their life and to have a long life uh, for myself to, uh, to be with them. I think the other dream is really to continue to contribute to, um, to my country. I don't know if in this way or in another way, but certainly to be, to be active and, and in a way um, also to give back um, what I have received um, and, and have an opportunity to share my experiences, um, my knowledge, but to put it again uh, at the service of my country.